Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Leslie. How are you today? Hello. I'm great. How are you? I am very, very good. I always um, love chatting to you because we're at opposite opposite ends of the day. So my day is ending and yours is beginning. Have you got a nice day planned today? Hopefully. Um, it's a clinic day. So um, yeah, should be seeing, seeing some patients this afternoon and hopefully the sun comes out. Fantastic. So hi, everyone. I see there are a few people live with us. If you can give me a thumbs up, um, let me know where you are in the world. Um, and if you can hear us, then I know we're good to go and we can start chatting. So uh, yeah, just post something in the comments so I know you can hear us clearly. And then Leslie, will you tell us a little bit about yourself and go why you're so passionate about exercise physiology? <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I'm a veterinarian. I've been practicing now for 15 years, um, and I started doing rehab sports medicine almost 10 years ago in 2012. Um, I have a background myself in swimming. So I basically started swimming when I was five years old and went all the way through college. Um, and pretty much as soon as I finished my college swimming career, I got a dog and was like, I'm doing agility with this dog. So pretty much like made that transition over into dog sports. Um, and obviously really loved it because I'm still doing it today with all my dogs. So for me, um, the sports medicine part was not only about taking care of these sport dogs, but also about preparing them to be the best athlete they can be and also um, keep them healthy. And so having a lot of understanding of exercise physiology, I think, can help prepare them for the sport. And if we prepare them better, they're less likely to have injuries. So that was part of it. And then it just carried over so well into the therapeutic exercise aspect of rehab medicine mm -hmm. that I, yeah, I was like, wait, I can plan a lot better for what to do rehab wise now that I know some of these concepts and understand them a bit better. Like I, I knew kind of how to, how to use them from swimming. Like I had that mm -hmm. basic understanding and then I was like, oh, this actually comes from science, not just my coach making it up of like, today we're going to go hard, tomorrow we'll have a little bit of an easier day. Um, so applying that to, to the therapeutic exercise and fitness and conditioning for our patients, I think can be really beneficial. I really like that um, kind of thinking about preventative yeah, preventing injury in the first place. So preparing them properly so that we can have athletes that are healthy over the long term and can perform at their yeah at, at their best level. I really love that. So hello to everybody who has joined us. Um, I'm Ane. Hi, and this is Leslie. Welcome, Leslie. Um, so we are chatting about um, exercise physiology. And <clears throat> I, I always actually, I really love working with Leslie because we always come up with these super interesting titles for things. <laughs> um, and this week it's Let's Sweat the Details. So um, it's really about getting into the details of why we're doing what we're doing exercise wise. Um, and like Leslie said, in terms of our therapeutic exercise plan. Um, how does exercise physiology fit into that? Uh, if you guys have any questions at any point, please do let us know. Um, you can post a comment and we'll put that up and answer that. And that's what Leslie's here for. So use her wisely. Um, and yeah, so let's let's then get started. I really love that. Yeah, like I've said, that you've you've kind of started now with the idea of how exercise physiology can help you create better therapeutic um rehabilitation exercise plans therapeutic exercise plans my brain's already scrambled i'm i'm at the end of the day so how how do you find how do they how do they fit together how do you find it makes your exercise plans better i think one of the things that i focus more on is 
like progressing, hopefully progressing the exercise. Like, so rather than trying to come up with new exercises every time we see them, which I feel like when I was a newbie just starting out, that was like a big pressure. Like I felt like every time I saw a client, I was like, oh, I have to come up with new exercises. (laughs) And after a while, I ran out of things that were specific to the problem. Like, and so I'd just be like, oh, let's do this exercise and trying to wrap my head around why it worked for the problem I was treating was a bit of a stretch. Um, So instead using these principles, I can make a logical argument, at least in my head, maybe also to the client if they have questions, but I need to have it in my head of why I'm doing something. So why, like I'm doing this exercise, they got better at it and then progressing it rather than coming up with a whole brand new exercise for them that maybe doesn't make sense. And so if we start to dive in the principles a little bit, you know, some of that comes from the said principle about specific adaptations to impose demands, you know, knowing what we need to be able to get this dog to do, knowing what their injury is, we can really make a specific plan by um, having specific exercises for that and, and gradually progressing it rather than constantly. Um, like, I almost feel like it, it was an entertainment aspect of like, I have to entertain the client by creating whole new things every time I see them. Okay. That's an interesting <laughs> point. Hi, um, to Iftikar, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And he said that he likes pharmacology. So... Yes, good thing to like. Very valuable um, tool. Definitely not my area of strength either. So, <laughs> okay, so so essentially you've now touched on the said principle, and that's about specific adaptations, right? <clears throat> okay, so if you're saying, can you give me a little bit more information? Yeah, go so I'm going to go to like a big example that I think helps. It, it's to understand. Um, If say you wanted, okay, this is going to be funny, hopefully. (laughs) Say you wanted the dog to play basketball when they were done with rehab. Just make that up. Um, You wouldn't necessarily treat the dog by having them play soccer. So (laughs) <laughs> it's and that's like I said a big general example of like specific specificity of it so if we get more into like a, a true exercise physiology if you need the dog to be able to sprint like say the owner really really wants to go back to playing fetch that was the love of their life. That's where they really bonded with the dog. It was their favorite activity. And now they've done something. They're recovering from TPLO surgery, but they really, really, really still want to go back to play fetch. It doesn't make a lot of sense to do a ton of endurance work. Mm -hmm. So telling them to go out and, and do 10 mile walks or 10 mile hikes isn't specific a specific stress on the body that it needs to get them better at playing fetch in order to get better at playing fetch we need to work on sprints but we also need to work on power um and you know and strength of the muscles to be able to protect the body for the kind of impact that Mm. happens during sprinting rather than preparing the dog for what happens when they go on a 10 mile hike Mm. So I really like that. So we're doing, like, we're already doing that, right? But being able to say, this is where it comes from is so helpful. Hi, Megan from South Africa. Just <laughs> throw that in there. Um, but but we are, like, we do think about um, this is an agility dog and it needs to be able to jump, do turns, do the weaves, go up and down, Um, So, like, breaking it down into the elements that the dog is going to have to be good at, right, the stresses Mm -hmm. that the body is going to have to be able to take, and then progressing exercises that are specifically targeted at those movements and the dog's ability to 
you know, perform that function. So that's what we're basically, yeah, okay. <laughs> cool. Yeah, the science sometimes goes over my head, but it's really awesome to be able to understand it better so that we can, yeah, apply it better and actually know what we're doing, right? Okay, yeah. so if we're talking about, we've now spoken about specific, being specific, <laughs> but we also always want to train the whole body, right? So it doesn't help that we only ever focus on sprint power, etc., because that's just one function of the body. So how does kind of variability to come into it? How does variability, varying the exercise program, like where does that come in? Right. So that is like, it's, it's really easy to get caught up on one principle and be like, oh, I'm focusing on that. And then you miss out on other things. Because while I said, you know, doing endurance work for someone who's going to sprint isn't really helpful. It's still good for building the cardiovascular system, like getting mm -hmm. those changes happening. It's more that if you were going, if you had the specific goal in mind, only doing that is not going to be helpful. So mm -hmm. you need to, yes, you still need to hit everything and work the whole body and think about compensations. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so also our rehab principles come in as well that I haven't really, I don't think is talked a whole lot about in like specific exercise physiology. Like I always think about, you know, if they've got a pelvic limb injury, they're probably compensating with the thoracic limbs. And so we need to focus on that, make sure they're not overdoing things, but that doesn't really fit in a specific exercise physiology principle. So you have to mesh everything together, um, all your knowledge to, to make it work and come up with a really good plan. I think exercise physiology, the principles, understanding them help you almost think more long-term and like come up with a long-term plan. And, and I like to think that way when I'm presented with a, a new patient, like I try to find out what their long-term, like, of course we have short-term goals. So we, you know, in four weeks, we want to be doing this in eight weeks, we want to be doing this, but we also talk about what the long-term goals are of the patient. And if it's an athlete, it's probably returning to sport and doing something in sport. If it's a, you know, a pet, um, then they have long-term goals too. Um, it may take them a little bit harder to verbalize them. Like you may have to help them out. Like what, you know, that's where I talk about like playing fetch or going for walks on the beach or, you know, something that they eventually want to get back to. And then you can create this plan ahead of time rather than necessarily going week by week. You make adjustments as you go through, of course, because, you know, things are going to change, but you can use the principles to kind of look at, okay, I'll just start talking about some of the other. So we look at like overload principle where we gradually need to be getting, making things harder and harder. We need to be progressing things um, so that the body's getting stronger. But then we also have to remember like the easy, hard principle. Like we don't always want to have hard day, hard day, hard day, hard day, hard day. Like we need some rest built in so that the body can recover. And I think that's important. Again, if you're just thinking about therapeutic exercise, that's important because we don't want to have them be doing their therapeutic exercise necessarily every day, seven days a week. Because if it is hard for them, the body needs to rest and recover um, to get better, to actually improve. So that's how I, I would use the exercise physiology principles more as a planning guide for over the time period that I'm going to be seeing this patient. And then my rehab principles are probably a little bit more of like the specific what I need to make sure specifically exercise wise, I need to make sure I'm hitting. Um, yeah, hopefully that makes makes sense of yeah, how no, it all that, comes together. <laughs> together. 
Um, what, what you've said now made me think of um, one of our Vetri Habits blogs that I recently read. Um, she's an equine therapist, and in horses, the back is like the center of everything, and it's all like that's where all the problems come up. And um, she'd been doing research in the back, so people know her as the back lady, right? Yeah, but she said in her blog, like, you can't be back lady without being the everything lady like one thing cannot be isolated the body doesn't work like that doesn't work like that so although we need that like deeper grasp of exercise physiology it is one part of the puzzle that makes up the whole of what we need to do so i really like how you've described that now because that yeah it just highlights that again for me um I like it. Um, so what are some of, you've mentioned overload now. Um, what are some of the other principles that we should be aware of? Um, so reversibility, I think, is a big one. And that's that's the the principle that I always like. The, I would say this is the sad principle. This is the one that like disappoints everyone because you want to just you know, I wish we could say, I'm just going to go work out for two months. I'm going to get to where I want to be. And then I never have to work out again because I've gotten there. It's good. And unfortunately, the reversibility principle doesn't allow that. You know, basically, if we start to not work out, not do our exercise, everything starts to go backwards and we start to go back to where we started from. And it's interesting, though, because it's not right away. So it's not like, oh, I took a day off. I lost everything, you know. Um, so balancing rest, appropriate rest and the reversibility principle is, is important. The other thing that's really interesting about the reversibility principle is the more you get in shape, the more you exercise, actually, the slower it happens. You don't lose as much. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's sad. It's like, if I could only, if that wasn't there, I would be great. Cause I would still be as in shape as I was in college. Um, yeah. but it also, it also, you know, can be like, okay, so say you're working out and you get sick and because you've been doing stuff, it's not going to be as bad as if you weren't um, exercising regularly or working out. So it's also important, you know, when we talk about, like, I'd say it's probably more important for our athletes than necessarily mm -hmm. our, like, rehab patients. Um, the other one, I, don't, I think we, we sort of touched on a little bit, but didn't actually name it was the general adaptation syndrome, which is like the big overarching um, principle of the body that like, when you stress the body, the body adapts to it. And it's general because we're talking every system, you stress the cardiovascular system, it adapts, you stress the muscles, they adapt, you stress the bones, they adapt. Um, but you can do too much. So there's like a balance of, okay, stress it a little to get better, to improve, to make the body ready for what you're going to throw at it. But if you do too much, you throw them into exhaustion, um, um, overwork, and that's where the body starts to break down. So again, all of these kind of fit together as puzzle pieces, because because of that principle of knowing like, oh, if we continuously stress the body, we put them into exhaustion, then we have the easy hard principle where it's like, that's why we have to throw easy days at them. Like, you know, we don't necessarily want them to not work out on a day or not do anything or, you know, Netflix and chill for a day because it's impossible to get a dog to do that. But we can throw easy stuff at them that's not really stressing their body because they've already done they, we already know they can do more than that. So mm. um, those are probably the big four principles big four. that, yeah. So we, general yeah. adaptation syndrome, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like that's also a really big one for us because that's really talking about, I mean, if we think about our tissue healing timelines, that's part of it, right? Mm -hmm. During the phase. The tissue needs to adapt correctly to stress and we need to be taking that into account but also on the flip side of the coin when there's chronic um dysfunction or injury 
the body is adapting to it and we have changed and altered movement patterns which lead to compensatory you know all the compensations that we see and all the different things happening in, in the body and that's not something you can just like give the dog a nice massage do some exercises and bam we're back to normal you have to go through the whole reversibility timeline right yeah. <laughs> go backwards to normal and then build up from normal to in the correct movement pattern so yeah i like how these things are fitting together in my mind <laughs> yeah yeah and all they all i think are at play and that's what i like about it like i can when i'm coming up with plans i can kind of logically go through and if i can say okay that's this principle it's like a check mark in my my brain of like okay i'm doing things right um so yeah i love how they all fit together and can kind of give you that that gold star check mark when you're coming up with a plan that everything's working together and and we're following the right science I, I, that's a really good point because often we also feel especially when we're presented with a difficult case or a, something that's a bit outside our comfort zone we always feel like where do i start what do i do and if you have um sort of a um a process or a protocol in terms of how you evaluate and how you clinically reason it makes it easier but then the next step is to develop a plan and a protocol for that dog in terms of their home program their exercise etc and this helps you to create that sort of yeah check boxes are we like are we <laughs> what the words yeah are, are we, we adapting are we being specific are we yeah. adding are we resistance are we pushing them? Because I think that's something sometimes we get afraid of to push a little bit because we're like, oh, we don't want to break them. But also we we need to. Like that's the way the body gets stronger. Like giving it a little bit of stress, overloading it a little bit is what helps it get better. So, yeah. So in terms of your competitive clients, do you feel this really gives you an advantage in – how you handle them and communicate with your owners? I think so. Mostly uh, not because they necessarily understand it. Um, I kind of, I think of the, the competitors kind of in the same way of where I was when I was competing, when I was swimming, where I didn't necessarily understand the principles of what I was doing. I just you know, had trust in the coach that they knew what they were doing. And then it wasn't until later that I was like, oh, this actually comes from a place of, of science and research and like figuring out the body. Um, and so a lot of it helps in being able to explain it to the owner too, of like, when you say, okay, we need to do this and this, they don't necessarily understand why. And some of them are just like, okay, I'll do it. But some of them, you know, they question, they're like, why are we doing this? I've never done this before. Or, you know, cause a lot of them do like their, how they get ready for sport is they just do the sport. They just do agility practice over and over and over. They, they go out and they do the obedience routine over and over and over. And that's how they prepare in a, a little way. They probably followed some of these principles, but they're thinking of it more specific to training rather than exercise. And so understanding these principles and being able to explain them to them and kind of make sense of it of like in human terms of like human sport, I think helps them a lot and gets them to go, oh, this is really important. And I actually should be doing my exercises and I should be doing this stuff. Because I think we all know, like, you know, we give them exercises to do at home but how good the compliance is is always a question um and the more you can explain i think you know how important it is um and give them real life examples i think they start to go oh, okay i do need to be doing this it is it is important and i and it's fun that's the other thing they find out like doing some of these things because they're always like especially if they're recovering from an injury they're sad because they can't do the sport with the dog and then you give them these exercises and you're like, this is your new fun time, bonding time. And then they're excited to do it. 
<laughs> they've got a new goal in mind, right? Yeah. I think understanding the why is important for the owner and it's also important for us. Um, I think about the owners who come to me with, like, yeah, with like, th this is how they do it. They want to do that. They want to do that. That's how they've always done it. And then, um, yeah, sometimes, I mean, sometimes they're more experienced than I am in training and working with their dog and being in their sport. Okay, most of the time they are, right? And so I will just say, yeah, that's maybe that's a good idea. Okay. Whereas if I understood the why, I could say to them, this is not a good idea because. <laughs> so actually follow my plan because. <laughs> so I think that would, yeah, that would be helpful as well and a different way to think about it. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. The more you can like explain that to them, I think the more compliance you get. Because if you're just saying no, you know, it's kind of like the little kid who, who's like, can I do this? And the parent's like, no. And they're like, why? And they're because I said so. It's like, yeah, that doesn't go over so well that you're just being like, no, you can't do this. But if you yeah. can explain like what's happening and be like, that's too big of a step. Here's where, you know, we've been working on this and now you want to do this, that, you know, and oftentimes it has to do with the fact that we're adding in other variables. Like, so we may have been doing just nice controlled sit to stands and suddenly they want to do jumping. And it's like, well, now you've just added in, you know, speed and um, like resistance and like a bunch of stuff that we haven't worked up to yet. So let's do all these steps in between before we get there. <clears throat> we've had a, we have a nice comment here. So I'm just going to put it up for us. Um, so I think changing ways of how they've always done it is one of the biggest challenges. People had six competing dogs and none of them ever had this issue. So why would they change it now? Um, yeah, and I think that's fair. A lot of competitive owners have had a lot of competitive dogs. So if they've never run into this issue, why is it an issue now? Yeah. Right. And if it's, I guess my question for that is like, is the issue an injury? Because if they've had six healthy dogs and then the seventh one had an injury, it's not that something they were doing was necessarily wrong. You know, it could have, there's no telling really like why that one hadn't had an injury. If it's just that they've had six dogs and they've been fine, they've never run into issues. Why should I start doing fitness or start doing conditioning? I would go into my spiel of like, well, I can make them better. I can make yeah. you win more. I can make, you know, you more successful. So that's why it's kind of like, I mean, the same thing happens in human athletics. You know, if we've always done, you know, trained this way for this event, um, you know, and it, it works fine you know, you're not going to change, but then someone comes along and starts beating you and you find out well, what's your, what do you do? What's their plan? And it's different. Like that's probably yeah. going to motivate you to change. Um, so that, I mean, there's, you, I guess changing the, like, we've always done it this way. The, the, the key to, to helping them work through that is finding their motivator. Like, yeah. Is it that now the dogs are getting injured and they don't want that to happen? That can be a big motivator, but it can also be like, hey, you want to do better? Let's let's try this. And maybe it's like, let's try it with one of the dogs. You can keep doing the same thing with the other five. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a, it's a fun project. Like I always see those as like challenges and those actually that's what motivates me. I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> challenge accepted. <laughs> I like that. I like that. That actually makes me think of um, the horse industry is like there's a lot of money in the in racing. So those horses have got to win. And um, so my farrier told me the one day he was working with um, with a race yard and he said, honestly, this week, a horse with flat feet wins. And then they want all the horses with flat feet. It's like, no, they shouldn't have flat feet. They're not going to run better. So it's like they're always looking for that thing that's going to give the horses the edge. And, um, yeah, maybe it's – they yeah, they are a little bit of a commodity. So um, it's a it's a different thinking, thinking pattern. 
this is Jake's door. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I want to chat a little bit about your series next month, Leslie, because you're going to be joining us um, on the Small Animal Platform for a whole month, four webinars, four hours of exercise physiology, and it's going to be amazing. So what can we expect from you? Well, definitely a much deeper dive into everything we've kind of been chatting about. So we're going to break down all the principles and spend a lot of time just talking about them, giving examples of them, how we can use them to our advantage. Um, you know, really, I hope to give you not only understanding of the principles, but tools that you can walk home with that you can say, oh, okay, I can, I can go home right away and start using this in the clinic and have a good understanding of it. Um, you know, we're also going to talk, uh, you know, physiology is in there. So we're going to talk about systems and like how exercise can affect the different, um, some of the different systems like cardio, respiratory, muscular. Um, we'll talk about flexibility and body composition a little bit. So that's a part of it. And then probably where I get really excited because <laughs> um, I love my sports, my sports dogs, my sports people is we'll hit a little bit on some different types of exercises that I don't think necessarily get incorporated a lot into therapeutic exercise. Um, I think we, we work a lot more in like rehab with therapeutic exercise on more like static exercises, you know, like our sit to stands and down to stands and such. So we're going to talk a little bit in the last one about balance, reactivity, SAQ, which is speed, agility, quickness, um, incorporating some resistance exercises. So you might use a little bit of that with um, all your clients, but especially when it comes to the sport clients, I think those those things become really important to help get the dog back to sport and hopefully keep the injury from reoccurring. Mm -hmm. I love it. I'm very excited. So after your last webinars with us, um, our community just said more exercise physiology, and this was the only option you had. I'm really glad that, um, yeah, that we're able to do this, that we're able to do the series on exercise physiology. And um, I'm going to give you, yeah, so we're starting on the 4th of May with physical activity versus exercise. Um, so can you give us a, a bit of an idea about this this one? Yeah, so this is where we're going to talk about the five aspects of physical fitness. So kind of already went over them a little bit, but we're going to specifically talk about cardio, respiratory, um, muscular strength, muscular endurance, mm -hmm. flexibility, body composition. Also talk about, because I think a lot of people, like we get confused about what is exercise versus what is physical activity. So a lot of times, and, and sometimes this works with our patients, we're like, just get up and start moving. Yeah. And that can be really great, especially if you haven't been physically active or you have the really overweight patient. Mm -hmm. um, but we also need to understand like what makes something specifically exercise and why we need to do that um, in order to actually get these changes in the body system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's webinar one. The second one is from the big picture to the specific. So I told you guys we make up, like we come up with such cool titles. <laughs> so what is this one about? So the big picture is our general adaptation syndrome. Cause you know, like we talked about that's, that's everything. Like everything follows that, that principle um, with stress and um, uh, over overworking and how we need to find that balance. And then the specific is going to be our specific adaptations to impose demand. So why we need to actually make specific exercises for our patients um, rather than just having kind of one, one thing fits all. Um, so how we can use that principle and 
Also, how to use it correctly? Because I think sometimes it gets a little too specific. So we'll go over that that as well. Like we get a little, a little bit. What is it? Like bottlenecked or um, like we're only looking at one thing, um, and we forget about the the big picture, the general adaptation mm -hmm. syndrome. So we kind of contrasting those two things and seeing how we can use them. Hmm. I'm very excited about that one. I think. Yeah, I think that's so relevant to everything we do. Okay, cool. Then on the 18th of May, the give and take of exercise. Mm, I wonder what that's <laughs> So this one, of course, so like give and take. So we're going to talk overload and reversibility. So how we can work to strengthen, um, get better, build the body, make it stronger but then also how we lose that and why, um, you know, different, different reasons or not even reasons, but what affects how fast it, like we lose things or we don't lose things. So, and what goes first and what stays a bit longer. There's it's it, the reversibility principle, even though it's, it makes me cry. Um, it's really interesting. <laughs> it's, there's a lot of caveats to it. So. Uh -huh. That's very cool. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and then the last one, the end of our series will be Beyond the Everyday. Um, yeah, and you've already touched a bit about that. Yeah, so this is kind of going beyond the everyday, going past kind of our, our routine rehab therapeutic exercise where we're just, I guess I, I kind of think about the rehab therapeutic exercise is a way to get them back to baseline. And then mm -hmm. this will be about how to get them more to their everyday life where things happen like playing fetch and also, you know, your sports stuff. So this is definitely how we can incorporate exercises that really look more at balance and reactive resistance training, um, speed, agility, quickness, learning about those and then hopefully even though we think about them mostly for like our athletes also learning how you can use them for your everyday rehab patients to really get them back to a normal lifestyle a normal doggy lifestyle which usually yeah. is fairly active yeah it is fairly active um it should be so uh yeah i'm very excited about that so guys if you want to know more about the series um you can go to our website um on unpedalf.com small animal webinars let me just post the link for you in the comments and there you have it um and all the details are on there what you can expect in each webinar and also how you can join us so obviously members all have access to this um all small animal online pet health members have access um but if you're not a member and you want to sign up you can buy tickets to the series um, and then you'll be able to watch them live or as recordings um but honestly i wouldn't recommend that just become a member even if it's for a month or two it's really much cheaper so um and you're welcome to cancel at any time so it just makes sense to go for the cheaper option um so that's yeah, those are the important details from, from our side. Um, and of course, we have a sponsor on board for this series. Um, so Leslie worked quite a bit with um, Katerina Mattioli, um, who is the owner of Flexiness, Flexiness Gang Rack. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they have super cool exercise equipment. Um, we've done some podcasts with Katerina and yeah, she's a very, Fun, dynamic person um, and that comes through in her products as well so we will share some information about them as well over the next month as we get get ready for the series yay yeah. yay super All exciting right. are there any questions are there any questions from you guys for leslie um while we have her online uh, this is the opportunity. If you guys are watching as a recording and you have a question, just pop it in there and um, we'll get back to answering it at a later stage. Um, but I don't see anything coming up. Um, we've had some great information. Thank yous. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Lizzie, for 
starting your day off with me. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. It was a lot of fun. I always enjoy chatting. Always, always. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye. Bye.